Hello and welcome to Meeting of the Minds. This is take two of our show because uh, there were some audio problems the last time. This is the interview discussion show that explores topics in the atheism-theism landscape in a civil and respectful manner. I'm pleased to have with me for this rogue episode Dan Fry, host of A Rebel's Cause Radio, a seminarian and the tattoo champion of the world. I uh, may have made up that last part. Uh, we're going to discuss a range of topics today, but before we do, I have a couple of announcements. The first and foremost is, um, I had said on Dan's show last Thursday, a Rebels Cause Radio, that the New Covenant group is a universalist ministry. That is not right. The New Covenant group is a place where theists and atheists come together to have civil and respectful conversations. That is it. It is not a ministry. Meeting the minds. This is take two of our show because uh, there was happened last time. Last time. I left the Google on. Oh, was that you again? Oh, was that you or was that me? With the, I thought with that the, was me. Oh, that maybe might have been me. I had oh, last time it was me. So, so, um, so once again, the purpose of me talking about um, the New Covenant group not being universalist is because um, I've listed a couple of places that it was, and the reason why it was posted that is because I'm the one who said that it is. And it's not. So, for Dr. Jones and Bob and Greg and Joey and everybody that may or may not be listening or will be listening and watching for the archived version, the New Covenant Group is not a ministry. It is not universalist. None of the above. We're just awesome people that get together and talk about awesome things. Period. Now that I've gotten that out of the way. How are you doing tonight, Dan? Well, I'm doing good for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Still doing, still doing good. Maybe I don't know. We we could go a different direction. I don't. Yeah, be be a little different. You were doing good a half hour ago when we first started. How are you feeling now that it's thirty minutes later? Now I'm critiquing what I said and not sure whether I should say that same thing again. You know, that's the worst thing about starting over is you're like, ooh, but I already said this, and like, well, you know, that's one thing I like about live radio is it's just gone and you don't ever get to do it again, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of technical difficulties. But when you do these things that are going to be archived, um, it's a little it's a little different. But but otherwise, I'm doing good and excited to be here. So. Excellent. So I have a bunch of introductory questions for you, and even though you have answered them before, nobody could hear you. So uh, we're going to go through them again, and uh, we'll see how well we do. But now you've had practice at it, so I'm expecting really concise and pithy answers, my man. Um, so let's start with the first one. What did I give you the first time? <laughs> no comment. All right. So how would you identify or label yourself? Uh, I would label myself as a Christian. Okay. Um, any particular kind of Christian? Well, if we were getting into a, uh, a, a different type of Christian or what kind of Christian are you, uh, I would say I uh, am Reformed. Okay. And how would you describe your Reformed Christian worldview? Um, <laughs> see, last time you asked me what my worldview was, it was so much easier to answer with I have a Christian worldview. Uh, I believe in a sovereign God. That's how I would uh, describe it. Okay, and um, so based on your Reformed Christian worldview of a sovereign God, I have a question about your interpretation of the Bible, and I have two ways of breaking it down. One is an orthodox interpretation, which means that it is the inerrant Word of God, uh, revealed Word of God, as compared to a non-orthodox version, which is which allows for more human interpretation in the um, writing down of the words in the Bible. Which of those two would you say is your perception of the Bible? I really like that you said revealed word of God. I, I'm going to go with that one, orthodox. Okay, sounds good. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the next two questions and roll them into one question. For you, how old is the earth and how old is the universe? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, one, I have... Uh, no real good answer for you. Uh, actually, both both of those questions, I can't really give you a good answer. What I can tell you about the Christian account of creation is that I don't believe Genesis 1 was written to give us a timeline. I don't think that's what God was trying to accomplish there. Uh, I think God was uh, telling uh, the Israelites that had just escaped from Egypt who he was. He was establishing that he was the God that created all things. And that's what I think Genesis 1 does. And uh, so I don't really have a good answer 
Uh, there's several accepted answers to that question within Orthodox Christianity. Uh, I would tend to probably be more of a young earth guy. Uh, but I don't care to put a date on it. I know some guys are really big on, oh, it's 6,000, 12,000, 20,000, 40,000. You know what, man? I, I'm good with however old it is. Okay. And what is your opinion of the biological theory of evolution? Um, well, again, that's, that's one. Uh, macro evolution, I, I, I probably reject. Uh, I don't. I don't see any real evidence of that. Uh, but microevolution, uh, I do accept. I do see that we uh, we change. There are things that we change for our environment. Uh, you know, survival tactic type stuff. Uh, I think that is actually. I think that points back to God better than uh, most things. So. Okay. Okay. Um, what led you to your current beliefs? Well, uh, I was raised a Christian, and uh, when I was well. When I was 13, I started getting in trouble. By the time I was 16, I was kicked out of school. Uh, I lived the next five years uh, doing whatever I wanted by my own rules. Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, I, I like to hang out with people that at least pretend to be smart. And uh, we kept getting in conversations about who God was and, and stuff like that. And I just couldn't escape it. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I realized I was still praying to God. Uh, in my heart, I still believed in him, even though I wasn't going to church any longer. I wasn't identifying myself as a Christian. Uh, I wasn't trying to identify myself as a Christian. Uh, I realized that I just couldn't escape that. So so part of the answer is from birth. Part of the answer is uh, from about 21 years old, uh, I realized uh, that, that not only was there a God, but I wasn't it. And uh, my conclusions led me to the God of the Bible. Okay. And in your exploration between the ages of um, 16 to 21, would you ever call yourself an atheist? Or no. Would you, would you say that you were an atheist between that age when you were kind of doing what you want, living by your own rules? I would say it's denying God. I'd say this is a word. Uh, but it was a relatively short time in my life. I mean, I'm 33 now, so that's that's a while ago. And all things considered, I've lived most of my life as a Christian. But uh, yeah, agnostic would probably be a, like I really wasn't sure. Uh, I, I believe probably the Christian God was the God, although uh, I really liked a lot of the Eastern philosophies, kind of the Gandhi kind of stuff. Um, I just uh, ultimately I didn't see a God in, in in those kind of philosophies. So okay, okay. I hope well, that answers. Well, I, I'm round about all my answers. I don't like to give solid answers. Oh, no, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your honesty. Um, and I'm not going to challenge you on any of, the, any of those answers because uh, I asked you those questions to get a feel for where you are on those questions so that it gives myself and my viewing audience an idea of where you're at so that when we get into the discussion section, um, they have a way of framing your answers. Sure. Um, so speaking of the discussion area... It now begins. You made it through the introductory questions, and <laughs> we still have audio and video. We, we, right. My computer has yet to explode. Okay, excellent. So things are going well. Now, the first thing that I wanted to um, uh, address is for the people that are watching this that don't know, uh, I was on Dan's show, uh, a Rebels Cause Radio, last Thursday, and you can see that video both on uh, Rebels Cause Radio's channel on YouTube, and I have it mirrored on my channel as well, and we got into a really good discussion on, on a bunch of different topics, and um, I really appreciated how nice and civil the discussion was. It was very laid back. It was very chill. Um, towards the end, though, uh, you did deliver the gospel to me. You did, did deliver a gospel message to me. And um, you shoehorned that in. It wasn't awkward at all. Oh, it was nice the way that you did it, too. I, I, I really liked your process because you were like, you know, there's a point here where I don't want to wedge the scripture in, but... And then you wedged the scripture in, and it was it was actually pretty funny because I think I think your co-host John busted your chops about uh, about your process. Um, sure. Oh, and by the way, busting your chops is my catchphrase, and I think that there are people watching that have made a drinking game out of it. So I'm going to try to say it as frequently as I can. So for those people that are playing the drinking game, they they have something to look forward to. Um, yeah. So That's the, the one PC, uh, version of that that though. 
Let's say that one more time. That's the kind of the PC version, though. I've never heard busting. I've heard busting your chops, but normally it's uh, some other body part that you're busting. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I, that's why I try to use the PC version so that I can use it on many platforms. Fair um, enough. So you did mention that, um, and this is your obligation as a Christian, as the kind of Christian you are, as the Reformed Christian, that you know um, God is going to judge. There's going to be a point in time in my life, in our life, um, that God is going to pass judgment and there are going to be people that will be saved and or not necessarily saved. I might be using the wrong terms, so please correct me. Um, and there are some people that are going to go to a not-so-nice place is the way that you phrased it. Well, I don't remember phrasing not-so-nice, but uh, that is one... Uh, Gentle way of talking about hell. You were, uh, yeah, I believe you were, you were gentle. You were gentle. Phrase it that way. Did I? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I definitely believe there will be a day of judgment. The scripture talks about that pretty clearly. Uh, I believe those that proclaim Christ with their lips and uh, their lives, uh, who have faith and uh, repent and believe, will uh, will join Him. And I believe those that uh, do not, who find themselves hostile to God or 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 maybe even agnostic towards God. Uh, will probably uh, well, I'm not God. I don't make all the decisions. But but what we know from Scripture is that's not going to be a pleasant day. Okay, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit, if that's cool with you. I'll let you know when it's not. <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, please do because the last thing I want uh, is to be uncomfortable. Well, it's it's not that it's uncomfortable. It's that a lot of people like to make statements about who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, uh, stuff like that. I'm not God. Uh, I am not. Uh, I'm not speaking God's words. Uh, I can only say what's in Scripture. I'm bound to that. Uh, God has decrees in which I just I can't answer for everything. I don't know everybody's heart. So a lot of times, like you know, I know on my show uh, we get a lot of people that want to talk about homosexuality and stuff like that. Well, I I don't know the the individual salvation uh, status of every homosexual. I just don't. And, and so I don't want to. I don't want to make blanket statements. As to where where they won't be going, I do believe it's sin, uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, there's a whole whole bunch of conversations, and that that's the only thing I try to I try to stay out of. It. It's not the I'm afraid to tell people that they're in sin. It's that I, I don't want to be the guy that says, "Hey, you're going to hell for this sin," because actually, uh, I don't think that's the sin they'll go to hell for. I hear you, and um, and. I don't want this to turn into that. I don't want this to turn into a situation where it seems like you're doing the judging that you think God is ultimately going to do, if, if I'm paraphrasing what you just said correctly. Sure. Um, but I do want to use it as a springboard for more interesting discussion points. Use it away. Okay. okay. So um, you're Italian. I'm Italian. We... I, I'm only 25%, though, but you got to understand, anybody that's got even like a... a a tenth of Italian, they go, I'm Italian. And so I'm one of those guys. I know I'm one of those guys. Uh, my family's from northern Italy. We're not Sicilian. So uh, my Italian last name doesn't end it with uh, N or I, -N -E or I and I or anything like that. You know, I've got our last name was Ori. It's not very exciting. Uh, but we do know about tortellinis. Nice. We make the best tortellinis nice. made. And uh, the little Wanda cookies. Mm -hmm. You make, you make homemade made pasta? Homemade. Yeah, well, we can. <laughs> we don't very often. It's time-consuming. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm big on uh, just homemade needing, pasta and homemade sausage. Yeah, just, yeah, just, just needing the uh, dough for that pasta, uh, unless you have like a good mixer, is just brutal. I don't, unfortunately. KitchenAid. KitchenAid but, yeah, we, the way to go. That's what I'm told. We, we used to make a tortellinis. Are you familiar with tortellinis? Of course. They're little, uh, course. Pa yeah, they're little pastas. You have little, little ball meat in them. Yeah, they're like basically Italian dumplings, and they kind of circle them around, so they look like kind of rings, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. We used to make those every Christmas, and so uh, about a week before uh, Christmas, they would start making them because they have to dry out and all these things, which actually now that I'm a germophobe, uh, dried meat for a week on a countertop sounds disgusting, but these things were wonderful. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what it is. The things you never but, thought you know, about, Italy, up, right? Yeah, in Italy they do things a little different. So anyway, yeah, so I, I've got some Italian in me. I'm also a part Norwegian and some English. I got I just you. Like to claim I, got the, you. I like to claim the Italian part the most. So are you Italian so, on your mother's side at all? Yeah, I'm Ita Italian on my mother's side. My my dad is actually uh, half Norwegian. My mom is half Italian or was half Italian. She's, she's passed. But um, 
but so I'm I'm only a quarter. Okay. Uh, okay. I, so. so the reason why I bring that up is, as Italian boys with Italian mothers, um, they like to protect us, right? Uh, so my Italian mother, Mama Maudie, did not very much like to hear somebody telling her uh, Bambino that uh, that he was going to hell or he was going to a place that's not so nice. So that's that's the main reason why I'm bringing it up. Is um, you know, of course, your your position is you're not telling me that I'm going to hell. You're pretty much just following the scripture that you study, and in the scripture, God says that He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, essentially. Sure. Okay. Um, so, and the way that we were raised, I was raised Roman Catholic. I think I had mentioned that on Thursday's show. Yeah. And the the interpretation of the Bible that I grew up with is um, leans more towards God being uh, omnibenevolent, all loving. And and his judgment is going to be less. Um, it's going to be less dependent on repentance and uh, knowing God, and more based on the behaviors and kind of lifestyle that you live while you're on Earth. Now sure. I know that that's not scripture based. Scripture based. Yeah. Uh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not going to argue with you there. <laughs> I mean, that's a fair assessment, right? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I mean, Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever believes in me will have eternal life. And that, that is, that there is no other way. Uh, it is not based off of good deeds. In fact, the Bible calls uh, our good deeds uh, basically used menstrual cloths. And as married men, we're aware of what those are and what those look like and how gross those are. So um, that's that's what the Bible says about what we think is good, um, our, our good try, so to speak. Okay, so that um, so I wanted to use that to springboard into moral behavior, because okay. um, good behaviors is moral, right? Sure. Um, so moral behaviors, you would have a very clear explanation and justification for your moral behaviors. So uh, I'm assuming. Uh, I again, that's you know the, the the problem, and and before we go too far down there. There are, there are Christians out here uh, that like uh, to really put the atheist or the other, particularly the atheist, because other worldviews like a Hindu or a Buddhist, they can say, well, I get my, my morals from this from my books. Uh, but the atheist doesn't really have a book, so to speak, unless you're using like Sam Harris's uh, letter to Christian Nation or whatever it is. No thanks. Uh, no thanks. <laughs> hey, Sam Harris, I, I, out of all the atheists, he's, he seems uh, kind of the front runner, right? Aren't you guys supposed to like him? He's a smart, um, he's a smart cookie. I just don't necessarily uh, his. If if we can just digress on Sam Harris for one second, um, Sam believes that moderate theists are doing a disservice because they're kind of um, being tolerant of the fringe theists. So he thinks that moderate theists are just as bad as people theists or religious people with fringe theories. And I think that that's a really weird way of looking at things. And he makes that yeah. kind of clear in his books. Yeah, and I, I, to be fair, I have his, I have one of his books. I have that letter to Christian Nation or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I've never read it. I read the foreword. Okay. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's not. I don't, I don't really take it, make a habit out of studying atheism, to be honest with you. But anyway, to kind of get, get to my point there, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of Christians that are going to demand that the atheist uh, has uh, no more moral values or. Or has no no uh, logic for them, or can't justify them. Uh, I think we can look and see that these things are beneficial. Uh, I think there's ways you can justify them. Uh, ultimately, though, uh, it doesn't really matter if you can justify them or not. Uh, what matters is whether or not God uh, has deemed it good or not, and and whether whether you your belief in Christ. So 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 yeah. Um, Kind of back to I think where you're going. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I think I have good I have I have good reason and I've got a Bible that tells me what's good and what God says is right. Uh, and you have some good moral behaviors and I think you can justify those as well. Mm -hmm. I mean I might not even be able to justify them. I, I would throw myself in with the whole um, uh, list of secular philosophers that are still trying to work out where morals and ethical behavior come from. I, I necessarily don't have. Um, I don't have a grasp on the philosophical underpinnings of um, why moral behaviors are moral, why good is good and why bad is bad, and why ethical behaviors exist. I mean, I'll I'll throw in the whole I'll throw in with the I don't know crowd, 
but but you're right. I, but you also raised a really good point that I'm going to agree with you on. I grew up in a culture that is very influenced by Christian um, morals. Yep. So I can't deny the fact that some of my morals um, are influenced by uh, by the Christian morals. Sure. And, you know, one thing that probably I want to make clear, too, is we've had a lot of this conversation on my show. And so people think, especially some of my fans think that I'm kind of glossing over stuff or not really nailing you on our, on our points. We've had this conversation. And so I, I don't feel it necessary to, to try to re-nail you down or, or not nail you down or let you go with the same pass, uh, trying to develop a different conversation here. Yeah, um, yeah. I appreciate that you say you can't justify your morals. Uh, it does make for an easier argument on my part to say that part of where I think morals come from is I think God programmed them on our hearts. Uh, it's, it's uh, Some people call it common grace, common good. Uh, God's law is written on man's heart. Uh, that That's where I think a lot of our sense of right and wrong go, comes from. But I think one could also look at uh, pack mentalities and stuff like that and come up with plausible explanations. And so I don't I don't want to say people that say, hey, this is a pack mentality thing. I don't want to say they're dumb. Uh, I just want to say I think I think they have an incomplete answer. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit that, you know, um, because I'm a naturalist, um, I, I would throw my hat in once again with um, people that have more of a bottom-up approach to uh, ethics and morals as compared to a top-down approach. And so instead of a revelatory or a authoritative um, handing down of morals, I do believe that they are more organic and an emergent property. Um, how that happens, I don't know. See, you sound more and more, more like an agnostic to me every time we talk. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that might be true. I mean, I've also heard arguments for uh, agnostic atheism being a totally valid um, philosophical stance, one having to do with knowledge and one having to do with belief. Sure. So, I mean, I, I'd buy that for a dollar. Um, so, I don't know enough about it to comment uh, and sound any kind of intelligent. Um, so I wanted to bounce off of morals a little bit uh, because you use okay. the Bible um, for your – you don't use the Bible. You um, – you study the Bible. Um, I do study uh, the Bible. That's true. Yeah, and, and in studying the Bible, uh, you have faith in the Scripture. You have faith in the words that you study. You have faith in the text. I do. Okay. And so you have a, you have a faith-based worldview. And, sure. And you would say that I have a faith-based worldview as well. Um, again, words in your you mind. have... Well, uh, we, we talked a little bit about that uh, last Thursday. Um, yeah, that was actually that John. Yeah, that yeah, that was actually John that, that talked more about the atheist faith. Um, you know, I, it depend, I like well, what you, you said on the show. You you said, on I, I don't know. I don't here's, – here's what I want that I don't uh, – I can't look at the world and account for enough uh, to, to be satisfied with the answers given in science. Uh, I do think that it's taking trust in scientific revelation. I think you're trusting men who have educations, and degrees, and credentials uh, to, to be delivering you the truth, that to have not operated off of presuppositions that led them to certain places. Uh, I don't have that trust in those people. I mean, you lot of, several times uh, on the show, you said uh, something to the effect that, that, that I trust these men or I have faith in men uh, and stuff like that. Uh, when, when we think faith, uh, a lot of times we kind of keep it to religion. I don't think atheism properly defined is a religion, although I think there are people that are atheists that are atheists religiously. Um, oh, well, dogma exists, exists in atheism today. without a doubt. So, so I, I don't, I don't want to be the guy that says, you know, like John likes to say, and I, and I love John, and I, I'm not disagreeing with his assertion, but he says that it takes too much faith to be an atheist. Uh, I've heard that that thrown around Christianity. Uh, I concur with parts of it, or the, at least some of the thoughts behind it. Uh, but faith properly defined, I I would say it's probably closer to trust. Um, you know, which I mean, it depends on how you define faith. If you're looking for something spiritual out of the word faith, uh, that I don't think atheists have. If you're looking for a, a broader definition of trust, then sure, it's faith. Excellent. Yeah, and I think we talked about that too. The fact that faith is sometimes used in an um, equivocated manner. 
sure. right? Where where it has these two definitions of trust and spiritualness, and sometimes um, for the less savvy um, apologetic. Uh, apologists or you know people that want to get those gotcha moments they will uh, they will get somebody to accept that they have faith in a trust manner and then spin it so that they it seems like they're admitting that they have faith in a spiritual manner but that's not what you're doing no and I, I try to I, I try not to do the gotcha moments uh, it's not that I disagree with like presuppositional apologetics I actually think some of that stuff's really really good mm -hmm. uh, where I think uh, the power to change your mind or change your heart about God comes from has nothing to do with me. It comes from God himself. Mm -hmm. And so if God is working in your heart, uh, then he will change it. He may or may not use me in our conversations. He may not use our interactions. I would be frankly surprised if he used a couple radio conversations. Uh, where I usually see God working in that manner, especially in, in people that... Are, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you a hardened atheist here. Only because I don't I don't know you well enough, so I'm just I'm presupposing this about you, Christopher. And so sure. so maybe that's not true or it's an inaccurate. But but at heart, an atheist probably isn't ever in the in the in the process of debate really giving a whole lot of thought to 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 the exchange. And it's going to be long after that those words sink in that they start thinking about it. That maybe or maybe not uh, they go, hey, I can't account for some of this stuff, or hey, you know what, this seemed right. Uh, for me, you know, we talked a little bit about Scripture and me trusting Scripture. Part of the reason I trust Scripture and I have faith in Scripture is because when I read it, it feels true. I read it and I say, you know what, this is true. Now, you know, you know, how do you do that? Because some of it's not literal. I mean, the Revelation isn't necessarily literal writing. In fact, I would say that it's apocalyptic writing uh, directed towards uh, churches in Asia, and that's why we see a lot of imagery uh, about dragons and stuff like that because we look at Asian art. That's a language they would understand. Um, so, but but I, I look at it and the, what what God is pulling from script, what God is having us pull from scripture, uh, some of the literal stories. I mean, I believe these things. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where the Bible is supposed to be literal, I believe it's literal. Where it's supposed to be figurative, I, I believe that the truth of of what God is saying is there. I got a question for you that I, that just came to me. It's not in my notes that I've been reading from for the past couple minutes. Um, sure. As far as people that are as far as people that receive revelation, are they predetermined? Are they chosen? I mean, I know that they're chosen. They're obviously, from your perspective, they're chosen by God. But are they predetermined, or can that happen to anybody? Can I add another? Uh, that question needs another level to it. Uh, Please Chris. add it. Okay, so uh, the first question would, is, do I believe that God reveals himself today uh, in a supernatural prophet kind of way? And the answer to that is no. I... I am actually a cessationalist, which means I think that the prophecy, speaking of tongues, miracles, these things have all passed. They had a time, they had a place in history, God used them to do certain things, and, and the need for them has come and gone. And so we are not, we are not under that, that, uh, that era anymore, that dispensation, if you will, although I'm not a dispensationalist, so I don't really want to use that word. Um, but... Uh, but that these aren't I so so if somebody tells me that God is talking to them, uh, I have some serious I, I worry about it. You know, like a, a lot of a lot of Christians use this language, like well, God said to me, or God's leading me this way, and, and that needs a lot of qualifiers for me. Uh, and that actually gets me in trouble with some Christians because some Christians go, why do you need to qualify everything I say? And it's unfortunately it's because some people mean that literally they got a voice in their head talking to him, and I don't believe that's how God functions. Could he function that way? Sure. Does he? I don't think so. Okay. And so um, I, that's not what I meant by revelation. By revelation, I just meant um, inspired, touched by God such that you, this, you know, the Spirit moves you to have the belief that God exists. Well, that, I don't... Okay, that's an interesting definition of revelation because when, when Christians talk about revelation, they, especially direct revelation... We're, we're talking more of like a, a prophet type thing or a, you know. A well, I have, to, I have to admit the reason why I put it that way is because um, obviously the Bible is, not obviously, obviously to Christians the Bible is the revealed word of God. But, sure. you know, I, when I read it I don't see it that way. But it's been told to me that when you believe in God you see, you, you put on a, you know, a lens. lens and the words of the of the revealed word of God mean something different to you. 
and it has to do with the belief. This is something that's been told to me by by other Christians, and so that I'm just and trying to I'm just trying to fit that into the conversation, as you know. So for the people who believe, um, were they chosen? Were were believers predetermined to believe? I guess is a better way to ask the question. If I leave the word revelation out, okay, um, yeah. So they uh, were, so they were yeah. predetermined and chosen. I believe God. I believe God. Uh, I believe in what's called predestination, uh, and I believe that God calls some uh, to be saved and others not to be saved. Um, though I believe the offer of the gospel is free and open to all, how that works out, again, uh, you know, a lot of people try to use the Bible to answer every thing, single question. But that's not the Bible's purpose. That's not the point, and that's not what God provided. He provided us the answers to things we need to know. Uh, we do not know the decrees of God. So I do not know who those people are. I do not know the method in which they become one or the other, how God chooses or does not choose. Uh, you know, I know that those who, uh, who call out to God, uh, repent and have faith, are saved. And beyond that, uh, I know that God is in control of all those things. So I know that he uh, predestined some. Uh, how do we know we're predestined? That's a great question. I, you know, again, uh, you know, when we have faith and believe and we proclaim Jesus with our lips, that's the best indicator uh, that I can think of as somebody that lives with a godly lifestyle, proclaims Jesus with their with their lips. That's that's the best I can tell. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no there's no elect glasses or anything like that. I, I, that's a that's a phraseology I like. I don't have my elect glasses on. I can't see who's a Christian, who's not a Christian, who God's going to work in the hearts of, who's God's not going to work in the hearts of. Well, that raises so. that raises a question for me. So, if the people that um, believe are predetermined and chosen by God, what is the purpose of apologetics? Well, again, uh, the apologetics goes back to uh, to the we don't know. Uh, not only do we not know, but God commanded us to go out mm -hmm. and, and declare Jesus Christ uh, crucified and risen, uh, and and so we 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 have duties. And that is what we're supposed to do. Again, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really, uh, I'm not an apologist, mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. that that's not how I would define myself at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm neither uh, into evidential apologetics or presuppositional or, or, or you know, maybe rational apologetics. Uh, I like a little better, but uh, I'm not any of these things. Uh, so. Yeah, that's God, we do them because God commanded us to. We we were supposed to have a fa defense of our faith. The defense is that Jesus Christ was uh, crucified and resurrected. Mm -hmm. And you have, a, but you have a show um, that um, that praises that praises Jesus, and it sp it spreads the word. Um, sure. But at sure. the same time, you know, uh, I'm I'm kind of thinking out loud right now. Um, oh, go ahead. So so you have a show that that spreads the word, but it's not really to spread the word in as much as it's like to have an intramural discussion about topics that are important to other Christians. That, that's the purpose of my show. Uh, my, my distinct show is, is uh, we, we actually have a, the phrase Christ and his sheep. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is referring to Christians. It is not necessarily for the sake of uh, debating. There's lots of that going on. YouTube is a great uh, format for that. We're not a YouTube show. We're a radio show that has a webcast, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and it does go on YouTube. It doesn't actually air live on YouTube. YouTube is always secondhand. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't we don't seek to engage atheists on the show uh, as a as a rule. Now, obviously, it's not a hard and fast rule. We had one on last week. Um, we've allowed uh, other people of uh, you know varying degrees of different faiths than us on. But but our point isn't to argue with them. It's it's to have conversations uh, about about stuff so we can expose partly what what maybe we're doing wrong or the pre preconceptions or pre uh, predispositions that we we've uh, we've decided these people have. You know, uh, one of the things in Christianity that a lot of Christians think when they think atheist, they think militant atheist, right? Because that's who they enter, they engage with most. Because most atheists uh, go about their business and don't interfere with Christians, and most Christians don't interfere with atheists. Uh, so when you have radio hosts and apologists and street preachers and militant atheists um, kind of limited in selection but able to touch everybody through the World Wide Web and stuff like that, uh, what you get is a very 
small percentage of the uh, majority and minority uh, talking at each other, uh, mm -hmm. rather a vocal than, minority. Yeah, basically, that's it's you know it's it's kind of like any other any other kind of agenda that we have. It's it's not really the masses that's driving those. It's those that are the squeaky wheel gets greased kind of kind of thing. Exactly, and and you know I really appreciate you coming on my show because uh, I would like to consider myself a non-angry a non-militant atheist and you know I like to have these kinds of discussions that you and I are having right now uh, where sure. it's a discussion we're being civil to each other we're talking about things in a non-confrontational way we might disagree about some of the topics that we're talking about but we're not being disagreeable about it yeah I don't I don't think that we have a duty uh, to be angry uh, at atheists I, there's a lot of, a lot of street preachers and stuff like that uh, and, and I love street preachers. I'm not trying to talk bad about street, street preachers. Uh, I myself don't do it. There's some. Uh, I have some methodology questions that I need to answer for me first prior to doing something like that, and I haven't seen it done in a way that I would feel comfortable. But um, there, there's a lot of these guys that kind of they think that, that the world needs fire and brimstone, that the world needs everybody to know they're wrong, to, to, to sh take pictures of dead babies and hold them up for people to see and stuff like that. Um, I'm not saying those things don't have their place. I'm saying that's not what I'm doing. Um, and, and it's not that I think they're necessarily outside of Scripture, inside of Scripture. Uh, but in Titus, uh, God tells us to be courteous to all people, uh, knowing that they were once like us. Uh, and uh, it goes on to say, uh, hating others, hated by others. And, and, and uh, there's a gospel message wrapped up, and it's in Titus 3. I'll, maybe I'll break it out later. It tends to come up quite a bit. Um, but, but that courteous to all people is, is it's really important that the word all is there. Uh, I, I think that we should have good conversations. I think that I can care about you. I think I can care about other other atheists and other religious people. Um, I think that, that if I did care about them, I would stay strong in my faith, that I would uh, proclaim Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, um, but that I can still engage in conversations that, that are beneficial. Um, I'm not going to win you over with an apologetic argument because if if you're going to be won over, it's it's not by me anyway. The spirit's going to use what it what it will, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. So, um, another thing that we talked about, I think you already addressed, and I think it was John mostly who was talking about this on the show last Thursday, was atheism as a religion. Sure. Now, you, you mentioned that a little bit ago, that you, you're not such a proponent of that particular uh, style of thinking. I think it can be, but I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I necessarily. So, you know, I, there are guys out there that, that make it, I don't know how you would segregate them other than we don't believe in the same things, how you would tell the difference in the way we act. I mean, they, they eat, sleep, and breathe to, to, to speak atheism, preach atheism. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I think that they definitely exist. And I also think that within atheism, um, if, if I can kind of bash my own team, if, sure. if there is such a thing. I've been doing it um, to mine, apparently. So. Uh, scienceism. You know, as, as somebody who works in a laboratory, um, when I see people that are not scientifically trained using science as the answer for everything, sure. Uh, I think that a moment ago you mentioned uh, people trying to use the Bible to answer everything, sure. and, and you saw that as a little misguided. Um, it's, sure. not, it's not as misguided as people trying to use science to answer everything. Science is very limited, right? Science is sure. meant to give would, natural I'd be the answers. first one to point that out. Yeah. Science is meant to give natural answers to natural phenomena. Now, sure. I, of course, have more acceptance of the scientific method and the results that manifest from it. Um, you, but I, I have a naturalistic um, worldview. Uh, Can yeah. I ask you a question about that? Go ahead. So, so do you believe in uh, like a, a supernatural at all? I mean, do you think something can happen that science just simply can't explain? If something happened that science can't explain, um, I th my personal opinion is that ev it, it would just be a mystery and that eventually there would be a naturalistic explanation. Because if it were supernatural, um, like a miracle... Um, sure.
it wouldn't be repeatable. So if something if something anomalous happened once and only once, it wouldn't be within the purview. view of science to study it because sure. science science is kind of reliant on the validity of it and the repeatability of it and if so, something were supernatural I'm only assuming because I'm not familiar since I haven't experienced anything supernatural I can only assume that it being outside of nature that it would be outside of the uniformity of nature as well well and that would be the supernatural would lead one to say that it's it's outside the the normal repeatable nature uh, so so I think you're right there I just I, I want to ask because I wanted to see uh, I'm trying to gauge where you're at uh, obviously uh, you're a very smart guy you saw that that would be a potential pitfall and had a good answer for it so I appreciate that but there's a lot of guys that say hey Science is the answer, and then you say, "Well, is anything supernatural?" And they'll tell you a story of something they can't explain with science. The science isn't explaining. You go, well, "What was that?" You know, um, and and that and that's a and that's one thing. I I do believe things can happen that cannot be explained by science. I believe science is developed by God to work the way it does. So when we talk about science, I don't have a problem with the scientific method. I don't have a problem with science being used. I'm not worried about it. Where I get irritated is everybody wants to talk about dates and measures and scales. And I, I know a thing or two about scales. And one thing I know about scales is they always are off. Uh, at some point, at some weight, they begin to lose their accuracy. It is just, it's mathematically impossible to have a scale that's 100% on all the time and so when we start talking about dates and stuff like that and they start throwing down definitive dates uh, a lot of these things are, are guesses uh, they're, they're, they're counting that the repeatability of the inaccuracy of, of the measurement uh, it, it works out mathematically equal even though I don't think that's always the case and in fact when we talk about like speedometers so I'm a car guy right gotcha um, uh, speedometers are off they can be off in the United States like seven percent for a car ten percent for motorcycles now, as a guy that likes motorcycles, I'm a tattooed guy that likes motorcycles, big surprise. Mm -hmm. um, I have passed a cop doing over 100 on my motorcycle and not gotten a speeding ticket. And the explanation for that isn't that, uh, that the cop didn't care to chase me down. As, as much as motorcyclists like to tell you that, oh, cops don't chase motorcycles. No, they will. I've seen it done. I had one of my friends uh, get brain surgery because the cops were chasing me, ran into something because he's too busy uh, paying attention to what the cops are doing. I'm sorry um, to hear that. It's all right. He's all right now, I think. Um, I haven't talked to him in years. But the, back to kind of the point, the, the, the more real answer is that 100, 100 miles an hour you were doing was probably a lot less uh, because they only have to be accurate up until a certain point by a certain degree, right? So it's like 10% up to 60 miles an hour. Well, after it goes 60, that, that percentage goes up as well. The margin uh, of error it, increases at the extremes. Yeah, yep. And so at 100 miles an hour, maybe you say maybe it says you're going 100, but maybe you're going 80 and the speed limit's 70 and the cop doesn't want to pull you over for 10 miles an hour over and uh, that's not unheard of. You know, so suddenly rather than you were, you know, going nuts on a motorcycle, eh, you thought you were going fast, but there's a reason why that those cars aren't just being left in the dust. And that's cuz you're not going as fast. Well, and I think that applies to a lot of measurements. Well, as a, as a scientist, the only response I would give to that is um, I, I hope that other scientists that you talk to are not trying to say that anything that they give you is a definitive answer in anything. Um, that's why we have error bars, and that's also sure. why we, we calibrate our instruments, because they're sure. off. Um, sure. Because there is no scale that can maintain its integrity over a period of time. That's why every year we have people come in to recalibrate our scales. That's why we have a control and a standard by which to measure our instruments to ensure that when it says whatever absolute number 
that absolute number remains the same or whatever relative number we know what to compare it against you know so that we have absolute so that we can say something is x parts per million or, or sure. what have you and and i and i agree that you guys do that i agree that you that that stuff's all fine and great where i have problems is so let's talk a little bit about the age of the earth um okay not, not that i'm going to go nuts on this subject neither but, of us are geologists yeah but but somebody says to me this is a million years old. I want to have proof that it's a million years old. Because what just would be like, for you? Well, that's exactly the problem. I would want a signed statement by somebody from that, that, that day saying, this is the day we buried this rock. It is this old. That's, <laughs> that's what I would want. I mean, that's in effect, that's what you guys want from Christian, Christians, right? You want something, some kind Not of... Me. Well... Most atheists, uh, to, to prove God to them, they, they would want a picture of, of you standing next to God. And then they would want to prove that that's God and not a cardboard cutout, you know, like the, uh, the ones you see uh, in Spencer's gifts or something. But, Those atheists are stupid. Well, I, I actually think it's, it's not, they're not as stupid as wanting proof's natural. We want proof. I want proof something's 2 million years old or 40 billion years old. I, I want to know how we know that. Uh, and, and, and I'm not satisfied when we really know uh, the, the best dated material that, that, that we can reliably all feel pretty comfortable with. Uh, only goes back a couple thousand years uh, for, for writing and stuff like that. And that's where I'm most comfortable. So, so when, we have, when we have literary works that describe the age and stuff like that, that's where I'm most comfortable with those dates. And even then... You know, we have we have manuscripts in the Bible that are dated. The serious biblical scholars that are Christians would question whether that date was exactly right, or if that was a, you know, a guess put on later or something like that. So, well, uh, it just seems interesting that um, even though you don't put your trust, uh, you don't put your trust in man to come up with theories, um, you do put your trust in man as far as written word goes. Well, again, though, we, we got to look at my belief of what Scripture is. I don't. I believe it's a real, real word of God. Um, no, but I'm, but not, I'm not talking Scripture. I'm talking. Oh, it seemed like in the last example you gave sure. that you would want um, you you would put your trust in um, written literature sure. about dates as compared sure. to like radiometric dating of strata, strata. that well, give that us ideas. Us. And part of that's because, uh, and and again, I'm not a scientist at all. Uh, I'm a car guy. I'm a motorcycle guy. Uh, I do talk radio. I'm a realtor by trade, believe it or not. Um, these are I'm a marketing guy. That's that's what I am. Uh, and I'm not trying to market Christianity at you, so just forget that I said marketing. But <laughs> but uh, when when I think of these things, like like Plato, we we know from other writings that Plato existed. We know about what time he existed, what what century he was in. Uh, you know, we, we, we can kind of get down. There's artwork that reflect him. There's there's other writings about him. Uh, the cities he lived in, we can we can look geographically and find, and uh, through uh, geology we can verify. Uh, I trust those things when it comes to dating humanity. Okay, mm -hmm. um, but but even that, if uh, the Bible said that didn't happen, uh, I, I'd be apt to believe the Bible. I, blind faith, if you want, but. But the Bible doesn't say that didn't happen. It gives us a, an expansive history that would account for those ages of things and stuff like that. So I, I feel pretty good uh, trusting those things. Uh, not to mention, when we look at ancient literary, literary works, the Bible stands uh, alone almost as far as the most manuscripts that we have. Uh, there is there's nobody that comes close within, like I think it's like 1,100 uh, there's a margin of 1,100, and so so we're we're looking at a lot of the ancient literary works we do have are of scripture. Uh, certainly, we have other things from Egypt and stuff like that. I'm not saying that's all we have, but the repeatable, uh, multi-sourced documents we have the biggest collection of scripture. And, and um, so somebody who is you know I'm not a biblical scholar, so I mean you, you kind of got me on there. Whereas my expertise is more science, and you're in a in a you're a seminarian. You're you're doing biblical study. Um, the little I know about ancient literature, um, my argument would be, um, if Christ really rose from the dead, uh, that kind of miracle would um, blow people's minds to the point where it would be 
in so many more pieces of literature that existed at that time that don't exist. Don't exist. Why would well, that I mean, be? Well, first of all, uh, God appeared to Christians, so most of the people that are going to write about him are Christians, and most of the people that wrote for Christianity at that point in history, you got to remember, first of all, we're talking about, by and large, uh, only only biblical, or not biblical scholars, but only scholars of the age wrote. The, the common people, scratches, math, basic mathematics, stuff like that, but, but actual written language doesn't appear to be normal. The, the ownership of books... That, that wasn't something normal. The, the average household didn't own a book. Uh, you know, the synagogues had books. Uh, the government had books. The average person didn't have books. This is why they had libraries and stuff like that, even back in those times, was because books were something that were rather rare. And so, so whole cities would have a few books. Uh, that's, so, that's understood, but when, when Jesus rose from the dead, he made himself known not to just Christians. He, he, thousands of people saw him post crucifixion well and and that's a that's a number and I'm not going to argue with you uh, on the number that saw him I know that Paul says here and I'll, I'll just read from uh, first first Corinthians 15 right this is dealing with the resurrection mm -hmm. um, that it said that he, he appeared to more than 500 brothers that word brothers signifies Christians uh, that's what we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ uh, it says, uh, most of whom were still alive at the time of the writing in Corinthians. So Paul's writing to the, the church of Corinth. So at this time, most of them are still alive, although some of them fall asleep. Uh, by asleep, he means dead. Uh, and then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one of them, timely born, he appeared to me, which was Paul. And, of course, that's on the road to Damascus. Um, so, so how many he appeared to, I don't know. Uh, what I do know from like what Paul just said there, the majority of them were Christians. Uh, Christ, but why? Uh, why would that exclude the story from going beyond Christians, right? So, well, if five hundred Christians saw something as miraculous as a human being rising from the dead, wouldn't that story reach in an exponential manner? If five hundred people, if each one of those five hundred people told two people, sure, that story would reach. How many Christians are there, Christopher? How many Christians are there today? Uh, millions. Billions. Oh, I thought you were talking America. No, no, Billy. Nationwide, yeah. Yeah, I would say that is exponentially increased. I would agree with your point, and I would say that 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 is that has been realized. But that's two thousand uh, years later. I know that's amazing that it's two thousand years later, and we're still putting out that many Christians. Think about think about this, all right? At that, the time, that, that, of Christ, that's, a, that, think, that's a different point than I was making, though. I, I know, but I, I'm I'm uh, let, let me tie it all together. Bring so, it. So when, when, when this happened, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, which Paul says is of first importance, right? This is, a, this is, a very, this is kind of the, 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 the uh, prestige, so to speak, of what Christ was doing. He, he rose from the dead. Um, people were saved, and people began this weird religion called Christianity that first was mistaken for, for a, a group of Jews, and then Gentiles were grafted in with the inclusion of Paul as an apostle. Uh, and people all over the place began uh, what became known as Christianity, and as Christianity exploded, it took over culture for thousands of years. I mean, you would agree, we even kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, that, that you were heavily influenced by Christi Christianity because as, a, as kind of a cultural necessity, that's what's influenced American history. Oh, growing um, up in a Roman Catholic home, how could I not? Sure. How could I not? Yeah, exactly. So I would say those are all tied together. You're, the proof that you're looking for is in the explosive expansiveness of Christianity. Uh, again, most people didn't write. Those that wrote, we have thousands of manuscripts of people, uh, of the apostles, uh, retelling the story. Who would tell it best? In fact, I would, I would say that God uh, breathed the story into people, uh, that, there is a, that there is so many manuscripts written about this. Uh, they are all written by the same guy, so to speak. The writing's the same. The... The, uh, not not necessarily the same guy, but you know, like the four guys, because there's uh, four apostles that wrote the story of Jesus, and then you have Paul who wrote the epistles. Um, th this is pretty much amazing to me. I mean, I, I don't I don't know how how else you can explain a religion exploding like this. Uh, I don't know how else one can look at it and say, oh, I don't I don't think the uh, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, 
is up for debate uh, as far as Christ walked around afterwards um, after he was crucified. Now, what would be up for debate where I would be more interested to hear somebody debate is that it wasn't Christ, that he wasn't really dead, these things, uh, which I, I would simply look to the Romans and say, pretty sure the Romans knew when somebody was dead or not. You know, they were pretty good at killing people. Um, you know, but they're, I, to me it's amazing. I, I don't see... I don't see how one could could ask for more proof that Jesus Christ was alive and look at the the religion that exploded because of it. I would, expect, I, I, I would expect to see more Roman literature about the fact that Christ had risen from the dead. Well, but but again, let's let's talk about this. So so do you expect to see a bunch of literature about all the falsifications that George Bush made when he uh, created all all this these wars or or Obama? Uh, no. Governments don't 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 air out their mistakes. That wasn't a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> well, but governments don't air out their mistakes. So Pontius Pilate crucified the Messiah, crucified God Himself. Uh, you don't air that out. I, I don't expect the governments to have these things. I don't. I, to, to be a little bit of a tin ha, tin foil hat guy, right? Why would the government speak badly about themselves? History is 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 written down by the guys that won. But but this isn't this isn't a strategic move that they're trying to hide. This is the Son of God rising from the dead. Sure. But you don't think that it's a strategic move to uh, to uh, silence a new and budding religion where the guy rose from the dead. You don't think it would be a good thing if you were the leader of a country that that people would follow this guy if you if you let this story get. In fact, Scripture accounts for this and says. The, the, the Jewish people paid people not to say anything. Um, I I have no problem whatsoever uh, thinking that, that the government and the other established religions at the time would not want this to be true, that they would go out of their way to suppress the truth. Well, uh, as, as far as dating goes and as far as evidence goes, I see that as shoddy. Um, and uh, as far as comparing it to like the age of the earth and things like that where we can radiometrically date within error bars and corroborate it with several different laboratories and they all come up with the same roundabout number within a certain error sure that seems that seems like a lot more valid to me uh, something I can sink my teeth into something that's repeatable something that is valid something that is um, uh, again that's not really the science you do though right Oh, it's certainly not. It, but it does. Okay. But it is, but so, once so again, you're, trust, again, you're trusting in methods that you don't fully understand yourself. Well, the scientific uh, method. They they all know. use the scientific method, and uh, it's published. I in, and the scientific I method is a form of epistemology that accounts for um, controlling for things like human cognitive biases and human heuristics and things like that. Whereas revelation, revelation. is prone to cognitive biases and How heuristics. Many how many valid scientists exist today that would be experts in that field in those measurement fields? Rough guess. Thousands. Thousands. So a couple thousand out of what 400 billion people. Where I don't know how many pe billion people are on the earth. I have 400 billion. It seems way too high. But um, I think it's four billion, isn't it? Four billion people. Is that right? Today. Uh, so. uh, for some reason I want to say 6.5, but I don't know why. Okay. So so anyway, billions of people. Uh, you're you're going to trust a couple thousand. Uh, I would say that that are experts. I mean, there are more than thousands that are. Geologists. But there, but there's thousands of theologians out there that I'm trusting. Uh, when when we look at the Greek and Hebrew and stuff like that, I, I don't, I don't think, I think we have an even exchange here. I, I mean, I'm not going to yield to you that the, the the guys you're trusting are any more, uh, any more legit th than what I would trust. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't yield to the idea that that science uh, conflicts with the Word of God. Well, it's not necessarily yielding. It's a it's a matter of apples and oranges. Talking about um, uh, historical science, like reading scripture, as compared to an operational science that is able to nail down things like history, um, like measuring, you know, the the half life of uh, carbon, the half life of argon, the half life of potassium, you know, things like that. Um, sure. It's let, in, let in the scientific that. method that is a bottom-up approach as compared to a top-down approach. So it's the difference between revelation and authoritative methods as compared sure. to bottom-up autonomous methods. But we both agreed we're not really experts in those fields. So, I mean, I, I'm not so, going to debate, debate you. But I'm talking about the scientific method in general. And, I, I, and I, would, okay. I would say that being that I'm an employee of science, I'm, I'm feeling sure. pretty qualified to talk about that. Yeah. Well, and, and and that's fine, and I'm not going to argue with you. I know I know your qualifications and your credentials, and I'm comfortable with them. Um, but uh, again, 
as far as dating goes, I, I have questions that maybe have good answers, maybe don't. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Uh, I believe the earth is as old as God says it is. I don't think God reveals it in Scripture, uh, so I'm not troubled. Uh, it's not a question that keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I believe God created the earth. I believe there was a literal Adam and Eve, and I believe the point of the first four books of the Bible uh, really were to establish who God is, uh, particularly when we look at Genesis 1, chapter 1, chapter 1 Genesis. Uh, that is to tell the people exiting from, uh, from Egypt after years as slaves, who the God that freed them was. I don't. I don't think it speaks to the age of the earth. I'm not trying to conflict uh, with these guys. Uh, I would have questions that I think are valid questions. Again, I don't know if the answers exist. Uh, I know that the guy I'm talking to right now, you, uh, isn't a, a man of that field. So it's unfair for me to expect you to have the answers. And it would be uh, dishonest of me to really trust you, knowing that you're not in that field, right? So, so I don't. I'm not trying to, to get into dates and stuff like that, but I just, when I look at Scripture, I think there's evidence. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced by the evidence, and, and furthermore, I'm convinced, convinced in my heart that this is true. And, and you know, the, a lot of Christians are afraid to say stuff like that. They're afraid to say, I believe this. I'm taking this on faith. And that's what I'm doing. I read the Scripture. Uh, I read it. It sounds true. Not only that, is my life benefited I'm not in a money type of way. I'm not trying to say like a Joel Steen uh, health and wealth kind of thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, but but since I've been living out my Christian walk, uh, my life has gotten infinitely better. And in fact, if some people looked at me, they wouldn't even recognize me. I, I, I think it's amazing that a guy rose from the dead and people are still talking about it 2,000 years later. And we know those dates. you know. And that's to me, it's amazing. If this was a made-up story, uh, why would people die for it? Why? Why would people? There's plenty of psychological explanations for that. I see. I I don't. I can't think of one. I you know what? I believe this, uh, Christopher, and and it would be a hard, hard thing for me to take a bullet for. I'm not saying I wouldn't. I hope. I hope I would. I hope I would have that courage. But it's not something that I'm rushing towards. Believe me. You know, I'm not. I'm not trying to go out and uh, to witness in the middle of uh, of, of uh, Afghanistan or Egypt right now or Syria. You know, because that's that's what essentially that would be doing. Um, although maybe I'm called to be, maybe I should be. Uh, I'm not there. Uh, faith is a faith is a thing that uh, you you have inside. It's a thing that I can't quite quantitate uh, and, and 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 tell you about because it's it's something that you just it's not have quantitative. Inside. It's qualitative. Sure. And it's, um, and it's a quality, you know, and it's speaking of quality, it's something that increases your quality of life. And without a doubt, I mean, you're a good husband, you're a good father, and, and that qualitative part of your life that, uh, that, you have, that you have faith in increases your quality of life. And well, I don't want to take that faith away from you. I mean, we had a we had a little back and forth about something specific. Uh, so, so. Yeah. Well, I I just want to I just want to be clear. I'm so far outside my field that anybody calling me an an idiot in your chat is probably right. I shouldn't have gone down that road. Uh, I'm comfortable. I don't know is. Yeah, I'm sure they are. It's all right. There was already somebody that said it was a waste of time to listen to me earlier. Um, I'm good with it. Uh, I don't do this because I think I'm great. I don't do this because I think people should listen to me. Uh, to be honest, sometimes I sit and go, why do I do this? Uh, again, it's my faith. I believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I know that's crazy, but you know, for thousands of years people believed it, and uh, I'm not so quick to shake off what people have believed for thousands of years, regardless of who says it's wrong. And, and then there are people like me that um, immediately question handed down ancient wisdom. Sure, and, and I'm... I understand that logic. I mean, when I when I kind of got out on my own from my parents, uh, so I got kicked out of school at 16, um, and I got out on my own uh, shortly thereafter, more or less. My parents, uh, I would I would leave for months on end, uh, come back, you know, when my parents found me or whatever. Uh, and then as soon as I was 18, I moved out, and I'd only come back when I was broke. Um, you know, I, I questioned everything. I, I didn't want any of it to be true. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to live by others' rules. I, I am the guy that, you know, like a lot of atheists go, well, I'm good without, without Christianity. I'm good without religion. I'm not. I'm not the guy that's good without religion. Uh, I, I, I'm the guy uh, that uh, 
did a lot of things I regret. I'm not going to get into my personal sin life here, but but uh, but there's none of my business. I don't I don't see a reason uh, if there is no God, if there's no ultimate authority, why I can't be the ultimate authority. Uh, but th the truth of the matter is that there's a whole culture set up around me that disagrees. Uh, there's a whole culture set up around me uh, that that was set up by somebody other than myself, by guys that don't think like me. And so I have to ask, well, how come morals, values, how do these things come into play without being passed down? And so so then I started looking at what was passed down, and Christianity is one of those things passed down. And so uh, in questioning everything, I really got a lot more answer than I wanted. And that was that, there, that our parents, what they were talking about, uh, that there was a lot of wisdom to be had from people that had been dead uh, for 2,000 years. And I'm talking about the apostles, not Jesus Christ. He's alive. Um, but uh, that, that, that stuff, that was the answers to my questions. When I, when I, when I questioned everything, I came back to this stuff was good. This stuff had value. This stuff made, made me a better person, made me feel like more of a man. I mean, there's reasons uh, behind these things. And, and that reason to me is God. And I don't see... I don't see how it could be different for anybody else. All right. Well, on that note, I think I, I'd like to wrap up the discussion section and move on to the closing questions, if you're cool with that. Uh, I'm cool with it. I don't. I really feel like I didn't do as good a job as I would have done the first time around. Can we just scratch this and go for a third? <laughs> All right. Forget <laughs> it. We're going to go till 12 o'clock. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So, uh, first question. Would the world be better off without atheists? Would the world be better off without uh, atheists? Boy, that's a loaded question. Did you stop beating your wife yet? Beating her at chess all the time. No, oh, <laughs> that was a good response. Um, I think the world as a whole would be better if everybody worshipped Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, what evidence would disprove your worldview? What evidence? The, the body of Jesus Christ. So that would prove that he was still dead? Yeah. If, if Jesus Christ didn't live, I believe he's crazy. Uh, thankfully he lived. Okay. What question would you most want to be asked by an atheist? Do you have a Bible on you? And what would that answer be? Uh, most times, probably no. <laughs> Um, it depends on what I'm doing, right? I mean, like if I'm working on my car and riding my motorcycle, I may or may not have one. Uh, I, I would hope that answer would be yes. Uh, that's not always true. There, there usually is a Bible. I mean, I got one right here, but I'm at home, so you kind of would expect that. Uh, I do carry a backpack with me with a lot of books, including a Bible. But uh, that that would be the question I would want. Uh, for atheists uh, that want to debate Christianity, uh, man... I, there's no other place that I could send them that they would get a better debate than to, into Scripture itself. Uh, if Scripture itself does not reveal itself true, you said yourself that you read it and it doesn't seem true to you, uh, it doesn't seem like it's the Word of God, uh, th then anything I do, anything I do is already lost. Right? So so the, the question I would want an atheist to ask is, where is a Bible? And I would hope my answer would be yes. We do have Bibles for people... Uh, you guys will like them. They're called Destroy This Bible. It's a program we, we worked out for a Rebels Cause Radio. They've got fire right on the Bible. It's great. It says Destroy This Bible Experiment. Uh, and it's basically, uh, and it, it's designed for Christians, but it, I don't care if non-Christians take advantage of it. Um, it. It's basically encouraging people to read the Bibles. When we, when we do my radio show, and you heard it several times that day, uh, we encourage them to read their Bibles to actually know what they say, to read commentaries about them, to see what literary scholars... I mean, I don't want uneducated Christians. I'm not the guy that tries to tell you we're going to lengthen your leg. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that says, hey, look, read this, study it, see what it says about life. I, I believe it has uh, the answers required for a good and godly life. That's what I think the Bible is designed for. Uh, I think and that's what I think it accomplishes. Uh, and so I want people to read it, to study it, to understand... Uh, contexts and and who, who the Bible is talking to and and you know not to cherry pick it you know you, you get these famous pe preachers everywhere that pull verses out of the Bible to talk about health and wealth and uh, the Bible actually is overwhelmingly negative 
uh, to the life of the Christian. Uh, we're, we're supposed to expect expect to suffer like Christ suffered. Uh, and, and thankfully, we've lived for uh, a long time now, uh, at least hundreds of years, in relative peace uh, since, and especially in this country, since the creation of the country, Christians have had it great. We really haven't had persecution. I don't feel like I'm persecuted. I don't care how many atheists make response videos to me. I'm not really persecuted. Um, but uh, that's what I want people to do is read the Bible. So so my, my, my answer would be, again, to reiterate for like the fifth time, uh, I would want them to ask me if I had a Bible, and I would hope that I have one to give them on me. Uh, if, if not, they're free to contact me at dan at rebelscause.com, and uh, if I have a Bible available, I will send it to them free of charge. All right, and what question would you least want to be asked by an atheist? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, least ass. I'm not really, I'm not scared of any questions. It's not that I'm going to have great answers. I mean, we've seen tonight I don't always have great answers, right? Um, I don't, you know, the the answer that that I, I dislike, or the question I dislike answering the most is a, a questions about particular sins. I kind of alluded to this earlier when we were talking a little bit about, I said, you know, I don't think homosexuality is the sin that's going to get a homosexual sent to, sent to hell, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people, uh, atheists, non-atheists, other religions, uh, when they talk to a guy, and I'm going to label myself as an evangelist, even though I wouldn't really officially take that title, but when they talk to a guy like me who, who is out there talking about God, uh, they want to talk about particular sin. Uh, and, and to me, that misses the point, uh, particularly when it comes to atheists, because what business do I have discussing what your sins are? If you don't believe that God is God, I mean, if I can't establish who God is, uh, talking about your sin life when you acknowledge no authority uh, of Scripture and God to talk into that uh, is kind of a worthless conversation. So I guess the answer would be somebody that wanted to ask me about a particular sin like homosexuality or, or bestiality or, or uh, I don't know, uh, overeating, you know, something like that. I'd Tattoos. I hate. I hate it when people ask me about my tattoos, or you know, like a lot of atheists. Well, clearly you're not a Christian because Leviticus condemns you. Well, you know, uh, I have an interesting theory about my tattoos and whether or not they're biblical. And the other truth of the matter is Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Uh, so if my tattoos are indeed a sin, which they may very well may could or very well may be, uh, he can forgive those too. I'm not trying to defend myself as anything other than a sinner saved by grace. Okay. What's the worst argument you've heard against your position? Um, the worst argument I've heard against my position. Um, agnostic, agnosticism. I don't know. Um, these are pretty important questions, right? I, I am happier to to talk to somebody who has questions that disagrees with me, like you, you know, or you know. At least you're thinking about God and the importance of God in, in society and everywhere else. Uh, the agnostic that goes, I just don't care. Uh, that's more concerning to me because there's really little chance to speak into that person's life. Uh, there's, they're, they're, they're going, you know, I, I do believe in this final judgment, and somebody that, that doesn't know isn't any better than the guy that is just dead wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, I would rather you go to hell knowing that you blasphemed God than, than to get to, to get to the judgment day and go, I didn't know you were real. You know, I and, 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 and frankly I don't want you to go to hell. Let's 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 reface that with that. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Uh, well, I don't mama, think I Mama Maddie's gonna come and get you. Yeah. Well that's what I'm saying. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't know that you're going to hell. I, I actually hope, Christopher, that you continue to study into this and, and God works in your heart and you do open up scripture someday to see that it's God's revealed word. Um, but I don't, I don't want people to go to hell, uh, and I think that not knowing and not caring is pretty silly. I mean, that's, that's, that's the worst argument. You know, I just don't care. You know, it's, it'll, it'll be what it'll be. You know, I don't... Because if God's real, uh, which I say he is, uh, then there's that consequences for disbelief. And if God's not real which you say he is or isn't, uh, 
then then I'm devoting my life to foolishness. But not caring one way or the other just doesn't seem like a good option. Hmm. And what's the best argument you've heard against your position? Hmm. It's made you take yes. pause. Well, that's that's a good question. Um. You know, I think uh, having other religions would probably uh, make more sense because that would account for a lot more of what I believe uh, is supernatural in life uh, than 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 the atheist position would. So, so I would say that would having having like a, a Jewish religion or a or an Islamic or something like that would make more sense to me as a better argument. Okay. And the final question is, if you could choose someone to answer the question, does God exist, what field would they be from? What field would they be from? Yeah, like so, what, so not so, necessarily who would you choose to answer it, but what field would they, would they be known for? I would want a child to answer me. Oh, man, could you go into that just for a hot second? Just for just for a second. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, said we have to have faith like children. Uh, I have seen and experienced as a father. Uh, children are trusting, uh, and, and to hear a child uh, tell you that God is real uh, is pretty amazing. Because even as Christian parents, um, I don't I don't know that that I could instill that faith. I don't I don't think that's something. Uh, that, that we were raised with. In fact, as a young child, uh, even even first, second grade, I remember going, I don't know if I really believe all this, but I'm just going to do it because you know I go to re private school, so I have to repeat my my Lutheran catechism. Um, so so I would like a child. Uh, I think God says there's this kingdom of heaven, uh, faith like a ch child. I think that would be for me the most convincing. All right. Well, Dan, thank you very much for taking the time out this evening, and also thank you for your patience uh, in dealing with all of the technical issues that I was going through. Uh, that were completely my fault because I had a, a, a wireless headset dongle plugged into my laptop, which was preventing audio from getting to Ustream and all that stuff. Now, is dongle so, the scientific term? Um, I hope so. Otherwise, it just sounds like a silly word, huh? It does a little bit. <laughs> so, You're welcome. You're welcome for the patience. I, I'm sorry. I I probably uh, you know that that did throw me off a little bit. Uh, so hopefully I was still. I, I don't think I was on point. I'm just gonna be honest with you. That was a horrible interview uh, on my part. I was just gonna but say you that you were right. totally on point, man. Ah, you did great. I I think I could answer some things better. Like I said, I, I'd go for the third time, but I'd want to hear this one first. Yeah. And then re rethink it. I, there's some arguments. I just probably wouldn't have taken up, uh, not because I feel like I did poorly or, or that necessarily my point, but I don't think I articulated my points uh, to the direction I was going, so they went directions I wasn't anticipating. Well, so. if there is any point in the future that you would like to maintain this correspondence or do this again, I'm totally open to it, uh, and I would like to invite you back on the show at, uh, you know, at your leisure, and uh, if you ever wanted a, an atheist back on your show, even though I know that's not the focus of your show, I would be more than happy to come back on your show for any reason. Now, that didn't offend you when I told you that in the email, though, did it? Because that seems to offend most atheists. They're, they're shocked that I wouldn't want to debate, debate an atheist. And... No, I, I, didn't feel, I didn't feel like we were debating, and uh, I'm your guest. So, sure. So the fact that you would have me is just, uh, I just thought it was very gracious of you to, you know, to make that exception to even have me on the show. Well, you know, atheists, you're not the first atheist that's reached out. You're the first one I've said yes to. Oh, I um, the, the rest of them had to call. Like, there's one guy that called, and he's a militant guy. Actually, has a tattoo that says "militant atheist," I think. Um, but uh, he, the rest of them, I've just said no. Uh, I thought your approach was nice, um, and uh, yeah, I thought yeah, we'll see how this goes. So I was really pleased by both interviews. I thought both of them went well. We didn't scream at each other. No, uh, no. At best, the hottest part was when we were talking about dates, and you got really excited about dating. Um, which I, I still don't trust, brother. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I just, what it is. I just uh, I know I know how measurements work, and I they scare me that we would make that we'd make, start making uh, theories based off of uh, off of best guesses. But that's okay. Yeah. And and science is is all about theories are just best our best guesses. They're best fits. 
I, I, I appreciate that you acknowledge that because you would be surprised how many people uh, get on the – like especially on the radio. Like there's a local uh, politician that has a show here in Des Moines named Ed Fallon, and he says that, that global warming is science you know, and that, it, that it's factual. And I'm like, it, it's a theory. It's a theory that's got some good evidence. It's got compelling evidence, but it's a theory. You know, you can't. You and can't all say, theories, all theories are merely best fits based sure. on the uh, the current evidence. But, That's it, but all it, it was, they're all yeah. best fits, and anybody it who just, tells you otherwise is not being a, an honest broker. Well, it's just always interesting when when guys talk about science that aren't qualified. So it's neat, neat to talk to somebody at least has some some preliminary qualifications that I would accept. So. So that was nice. So and I didn't even get to break out my big voice. Uh, do it now. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can. Is it working? It doesn't seem to be working. Oh man. Oh, here we are. <laughs> I, I was turning the wrong button. I sound like somebody that's in like witness protection program. So there you go. That was awesome. All right, so for people that are still watching, I would very much like for you to check out my show this coming Sunday. I'm going to have Paul Taylor on from Creation Today Ministries, and that's going to be at 4 o'clock Central, 5 o'clock Eastern. Thank everybody for watching, and anybody who's watching this on Archive, thank you for checking it out. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.